right, good morning everyone. Welcome to Willow Grove Bible Church. Uh, whether this is your first time or a long time, or if you're watching from the phone or watching here in person, we're glad you're here. This is the third week of four for our Advent journey into preparation for Christmas Day, Christmas uh, season. Trying to note special interest in the, the joy, the hope, the love, and the peace that comes with Advent and clearing the way sometimes for what could distract the Christmas season to try to keep us focused on Christ and, and how we have to be active in that space. So we're glad to be here and we're glad you're here. Thanks to the worship team this morning for being here and taking us into a space where we can see and hear the Lord. So would you join me in a word of prayer as we take off? Lord, thank you so much for today and for this crew. Thanks for being ever-present in our lives. Thanks for allowing us space to see you. Lord, I pray that you would clear our minds and our hearts, leave us open before you to hear from you, to seek your face, to be led and guided by the Holy Spirit, and that this would be more than just the church, that this would be the time for you to inspire us, motivate us, and train us up in righteousness. It's in your name we pray all this. Amen.
Good morning. morning. I'm a little nervous because the crowd's getting a little bit bigger. <laughs> For those that are visiting and those that are here regularly, it's, if you need to, uh, the nursery is open as of now. So if you want to take your children there or send them there. It's in Matthew 2, 1 to 12. And Matthew 2, 1 to 12 is about the Magi going to seek out the Christ child. And then a request was made by Herod that when they get done, come on back and tell me where he is so I can worship him too. Well, that may not be the exact words he used, but that's what he meant. Well, they decided that they weren't going to go back. So I don't know if their decision was part of co-creating peace because they felt that once they told Harry, things would change. So maybe that's part of co-creating peace. But stay here and Jason will tell us what it's all about. I have uh, a prayer request that was started by Diana last week. And it has to do with a local school, uh, Upper Moreland High School. There was um, a meeting last week that involved hundreds of parents that showed up and asked what the school was going to do for the students that were there because they felt that they were failing them. That may be not just an Upper Moreland School District, but other school districts as, as well, who seem to be missing the mark on assisting parents and the community on instilling ethical and moral character in our children. So, maybe if they did a little bit better, that could be co-creating peace as well. 1 Corinthians 15.33, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And the second thing was that they discussed was discipline. Do not hold back discipline from a child. Proverbs 23.13 and Proverbs 22.6. Train up a child in the way he or she should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. And I found this little poem in a Daily Bread page that I had I apparently ripped out of a Daily Bread book, uh, December 28th of who knows what year. But it says, Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey. So with that said, anybody have any prayer requests, any praises? Yeah, Mark. Yeah, we can uh, pray for Larry, Larry and They were going to be here this morning. Uh, in the middle of the night, I got a couple of texts. 
a doctor. Uh, basically, he was taken to the ER in an ambulance, and there he was. He was vomiting blood, he had some stomach issues in the night, and he passed out a couple times at that point. That was Larry? Larry. And I, I've been kind of texting back and forth this morning. He's still in the ER as of 9 a.m., waiting for the room and they're waiting for the test results. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Everyone is well. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Diana Rose Ouko. Uh, back home, I'm called Mama Kimberly. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I'm so grateful and thankful that you know I've been given this great, big opportunity to just do this work. I'd say I'm doing it for the Lord because everything that we do in here, we are doing God's work. And I'm humbled and grateful. So I'm here to just say a little, a few things about what's going to happen and the Kenyan reception. I'm sure most of you have heard about it. I'm hosting that event and all the food and everything that's going to be made is going to be Kenyan. Mm -hmm. And um, me and my family and friends, you know, we're just going to make it different for you guys. <laughs> so I was I want to make a humble request to anyone who feels like, you know, perhaps they have allergies I need to know. Of, just let me know. Uh, we are big on spice, <laughs> even with tea. So just reach out to me if you feel like you have allergies about something you don't eat so that I'm aware and we can make something different for you. And if you also need to help, just, you know, let me know. We'll begin cooking from the morning of the 24th. Mm -hmm. Most of the food will be made in my house. A few, you know, daily cases will be made here in the kitchen downstairs, just to make work easier. So if you want to help, if you want to, you know, do something, um, I'm very particular about not asking people to bring food <laughs> because I just want to make it the Kenyan event, making work easier for you. I'm giving back to you because this church has really been like, it's my family, you know, you've been there for me. I do not think I have anyone in this country apart from this church. So I'm very grateful to you and my children too are very grateful and I feel this is an opportunity for us to give back to this church for standing by me, making me go through all these months after the death of my husband. Up to this day, I did not make it. Mm. So I was desperate, but now I found a home, and so I'm grateful, and thank you so much. So feel free to reach out to me. Um, just if you need to help, reach out to me. If you have allergies, reach out to me. That's all I can announce at this point. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thanks, Diana. Yeah. So over the last several weeks, God's been reminding me of opportunities when they say there's six degrees of separation between any two people, but in God's kingdom, we have three. And so I have a whole list of, from, I moved after college to Michigan, started going to a small church, had less than 100 people, and they said, turn around and greet one another. I turned around and was face to face with somebody that I rode the bus to school with from kindergarten to high school. Um, I called him by his brother's name, but my friend, my brother and his brother were friends, so but, you know, just little things like that. Well, last week I had the opportunity to go visit some friends in Nashville, and that was a huge blessing, just seeing people that I hadn't seen in about 20 years. And um, I spoke to one of them who um, had lived in Kenya for 22 years, and so I texted Diane and said, Do you, are you familiar with this? village Mbita, and she said that's the village your mom had lived in. And the, the school that Judy worked in 
was a school that some of the relatives yeah. graduated from. Amazing. It's just again that in God's economy, <laughs> we're all connected so closely that we can't even imagine. Yeah. And also thankful for Carl and Sue for picking them up their books. And for Rachel for taking the picture. <laughs> Yes, ma'am, Ken. Um, I would like to um, once again praise God for, I got the results of my, uh, my biopsy that um, it was a cancerous tumor, but they removed it all, and my doctor is happy that it's removed, and, um, you know, I have to go for some treatments down the road, but all in all, it was God that brought me to this doctor and um, that they found it early enough. It's not invasive, so all those things are, are good and I feel good. And, you know, he's just kept me really peaceful that mm -hmm. Because that word always scares me cancer. But you know what? It's, it's one of these things that happens in life. And, I, it makes me think, like, what do people do that they're not aware of? Mm -hmm. like, what do you, how do you get through something like a diagnosis or some kind of disease if you don't have the course the whole time? Mm -hmm. And I felt like when I was going through this, I was I kept remembering the story that Jesus told about the woman in that village when she saw Jesus walking through the village and she threw herself on the ground and she fell mm -hmm. on to the hem of his garment mm -hmm. and he healed her. Mm -hmm. So um, it's through faith that I was able to hear you. Mm -hmm. And the doctors also said that uh, first. So I went to her because she said that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's her name? Angie. One other thing. <clears throat> I'm sorry. If you can, during the week, remember these prayer requests. They're not just for today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Keep them on your heart and your mind. And when you get an opportunity, don't close your eyes when you're driving a car. But <laughs> if you're driving, you can pray. Just remember them day to day. Okay, we don't. Oh, I knew it. I was waiting. <laughs> but we just feel so blessed to be back at the church. Mm -hmm. we, uh, yesterday we retested just to play it safe with one goal, and that was to come to church today. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for your service. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day that we have the opportunity set aside for this day to come and be in your house, be with our friends, spend time together, and worship you. We thank you for the many blessings that you've given to the people and the members of this church and the family of yours. For Cynthia and the uh, experience she's had this past week and for Karen the praise that she has for the negative results of the biopsy and the witness she's been for you uh, in the with those that she came in contact with while she's going through this process 
And we pray for Meg and Dave who bless you and bless our church. And this church wouldn't be anything without you here as the center of why we come. To learn about you and to worship you and to sing praises to you. And for the healing that Meg and Dave have experienced <clears throat> over this past couple of weeks. That you've been there with them and kept them and healed them. We pray for Angie. Uh, I We don't know what struggle she's going through right now, but you do. We pray that you'll be with her and your presence will be known to her in a way that you make it known. And that she'll realize that these other comforts that she's looking for are in you. The comfort she can get from you is the best she could ever receive. And we pray for the Upper Moreland School District and the other schools that have a responsibility to help train and help actually raise uh, our children, our grandchildren, in a way that would they would learn from not just the math and the sciences and the other courses that they take, but for life as well. What it means to get along with one another. As we know, not everyone in that schools know you as their savior. And we pray that uh, you will work within these organizations so that they will feel a presence. And if you need help, maybe there's someone in the administration that would reach out to you for help and you will be there for them. So dear Lord, we pray for them and that they'll be guided in a way that will be an example of the way the good morals and ethics in our children. Dear Lord, we again thank you for this season where you sent your son for the ultimate goal to die for our sins. Dear Lord, we pray and thank you for everything that you've supplied for us and the growth and the visitors that come to our church to help us grow and reach out to our community. Dear Lord, we pray in your name. Amen. One more thing. I, there's lunch after. Stay in mind. <laughs>
Well, good morning, everybody. Carl, you got something? I failed. You failed? How did you fail? You forgot Larry. Yeah, let's pray for Larry. Would you join me as we do pray for Larry? If you don't know, Larry is one of our elders here, and uh, he and his wife are missionaries, and they're serving here in Stateside right now. And actually, he's got quite a significant leadership role for a temporary time uh, where he's at, so there's no doubt the stress of that is uh, not helping the situation. So don't know if he's watching, uh, if they're watching right now, but if they are, would you all join me and pray for Larry and, and Adriana? Dear Lord, we ask for your healing hand to be on Larry now. Oh, that we could go and anoint him. <laughs> but you can. Lord, we ask that you would divinely do something with Larry now. Something that can't be accomplished by anyone sitting here. Something that only you could do. Would you add vent into his life right now? We ask for his, his stomach to be healed. We ask for the bleeding to stop in your name. We ask for the pain to subside and for any fear and doubt surrounding him now to be eliminated by the work of your Holy Spirit in his life, by the salvation offered to him through your son. And Father, would you reassure him, even in a state that is low, just how much you love him and care for him. Lord, we ask for all these things to be done in your holy and precious name. Amen. So you've journeyed with us, perhaps. Actually, first I feel like there's so many of you out there that I don't recognize that I should introduce myself. I'm Jason, a teaching pastor here, a lead pastor at the church, and it's nice to see so many unfamiliar faces. Um, whether this is your first time, I don't know. I haven't been here forever, so you may have just been coming back after a while. But if it's your first time, welcome to Willow Grove Bible Church. We're glad that you, you came. We've been working through a series, uh, actually, over the last couple of weeks, the Advent series. This is the Advent season. And in the Advent season, what we've talked a lot about is how do we use these weeks as a preparation to Christmas? Christmas provides a unique dilemma for Christians, I think. In a, in a world that will tell you that, you know, it's all about the, uh, the, the food and the people and the presents that you open up on Christmas morning and the, and the Santa Claus and the snowmen, which is all part of the seasonality, right? But as believers, we're stuck because we do know that this only exists because people are trying to fill a gap with other things at this time of the year that Christ can over and above fulfill in and of himself. But yet we want those parts of the season. We do enjoy the break. We do enjoy the, the family atmosphere that, that Christmas brings. But it should be a dilemma for us always. That we might not ever lose sight of the fact that we are gathering around someone, not something, at this time of year. That someone, of course, is Jesus. The only Son of God given to us that we might have salvation unto eternity with the Father in heaven. He came as a baby to be identified, to be one with us, Emmanuel, that we might have understanding, that we would, he would have agency as a human, that we're not just worshiping some far off thing that we can't seek, know, understand, or learn from, but that he is here. And it only makes sense that he would come as a baby, since that's how we all arrived to the space that we're at right now. We can readily identify with that. If he came in another way, on a flying saucer or something like that, in, in, in a gold chariot that landed with flames coming off the side of it, we wouldn't identify with that. We would look at it and perhaps try to worship it, but it would be unfamiliar. But every mother here, every child, every father knows the growth cycle of a baby to adolescence. Therefore, we can identify and thank God that he sent his son in such a way. We started the book two weeks, three weeks ago, I should say, about hope. 
talking through what is it like to sustain hope when you have a genealogy like Jesus that contains some uh, unorthodox folks. <laughs> Matthew 1 just lists the genealogy of Jesus, and we talked a lot about how when I was younger, or when maybe perhaps you were younger, you look at genealogies and you just kind of skip right over them because it doesn't make any sense. Let's get to the story, right? But the genealogy is the story. It's the space that we engage in to know from whom Christ came. It expresses the lineage of his adopted father, Joseph, all the way back through to Abram. And in that space, we realize that there is room for people like us in the history and the genealogy of Christ. We kind of tease that out a little bit, unpack some of those folks that were inside of that genealogy, and we, we realize that hope was shouting through generation after generation after generation. And the seventh of sevens, starting with Christ's birth 2,000 some years ago. Last week, we talked about living out love and the conundrum that Joseph found himself in, betrothed, right, engaged to be married, trying to do the right thing, and then being told by an angel of the Lord that your soon-to-be wife is already pregnant. And there was no man responsible for it. How would you move forward in that space? And, and he thought he might try to slide away and, and, and divorce her quietly so as not to ruin either of their reputations. And as he kind of fostered this plan, this exit strategy, if you will, of his marriage, the Spirit of God came in and said, no, you won't do that. Instead, you will raise this boy. You will name him Jesus. And Joseph had to make a living out love maneuver. No doubt full of ridicule from others. No doubt having to comfort Mary at times when the world, no one understood what she was going through. And in that space of accepting to join arms with her to raise this boy, the son of God, having no idea what they were about to engage in, he stayed. The spirit of God was at work in him and he listened. And he loved her and he loved Jesus. This week, is peace, the peace candle. We've been lighting some candles every week. The Advent wreath surrounded that by an eternal understanding of the love of God and the work of God in our lives. And then we lit the first candle on the Hope Week. And the candles are darker in color and they get whiter as you go in. And the point being is that what we're doing is we're burning away those things that keep us from Jesus. Those sins, those, those distractions, the, the things that at Christmas time deter us from thinking on Christ. And as those candles burn down and we get to the middle on Christmas Eve service, we will light the Jesus candle. Larry and Adriana were supposed to actually do this this morning, and I did pull an audible, and Kim was very kind to step up and to take the, the peace candle. So I'm going to let them talk a little bit about what peace means to them, and then they'll light the, the third candle. I wanted to start with scripture with uh, this Advent day celebrating peace. <clears throat> Luke 2 says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, <clears throat> a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel with a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And I found two, um, Kim and I talked about what to share this morning, and two verses in that uh, scripture are particularly interesting and challenging. Verse 10 says, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Now the angels gave us a great example of a testimony for the Lord, creating an atmosphere of peace. Fear not, good tidings coming, great joy, and it's for everybody. Think about this when you meet people this season with that great message. And you'll be surprised at times when you can minister to someone. 
Kimberly and I were shopping one Christmas at Franklin Mills Mall, the J.C. Penney, and as we came to the cashier, she just started crying. She was just overwhelmed with things, and we had the blessing of ministering to her. So even if you're afraid, the message is fear not, good tidings, great joy, and it's for you. A message you can receive for yourself and then share with others. And then the second verse, to wrap it up, verse 14. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The peace that God sent was not an atmosphere of peace, but a person who was peace. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders. And he'll be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So this was the Prince of Peace, the Creator, Jesus our Savior, and our Brother with God the Father. So this is a family thing. We're afforded the opportunity to be co-creators of peace with Jesus our brother and God our Father. So when can we put this into practice, this ministry of peace? Well, how about within the church family? That's a good place to start. Discourse groups, church dinners like today, you're all invited, uh, with our friends and neighbors when we gather at Christmas Eve here at church and with others. Or whatever situation the Lord may prepare for you, with this message of peace. Fear not, there's good tidings, great joy, and it's for everybody. Thanks to the Rubies for subbing in, which was more than a subbing, by the way. If you just wrote that this morning, I'm very impressed. <laughs> Very impressive. I will say that uh, by watching from the backstage some of the preparations that are taking place for this Christmas Eve, and I can assure you, you're in for a treat should you be joining us. Um, obviously, we want to all be present and helpful and in that space enjoying what Diana and her friends and family want to do for us. You know, I've, I've always been a firm believer that the gathering that you have should reflect all of the backgrounds, all the cultures that exist in the room, and not just the leadership. And so I'm very excited about this. Very, very. I hope my mouth burns like fire. Whatever it's going to, I'll take it all. Whatever you got, Diane. No. <laughs> I'm excited because to me, this feels like a, a step for our church in a direction that I, I, I really think God is taking us, which is to be open to the various expressions of who He is. And some of those expressions we may not initially agree with or understand. There's a lot about the Kenyan culture I don't get. I didn't grow up there. It's not that I am uh, opposed to it, I just don't know. I'm naive. Hopefully more than ignorant. <laughs> but I want to learn. And we should want to learn from one another's perspectives and backgrounds and what we bring to the table of our lives. I think this is a part of the challenge for the church at large today. And I think a challenge that is often not accepted by churches. It's just cleaner and easier to have one perspective. To operate from one understanding. It gets messy when you start including other people's backgrounds and, 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 and their baggage and, or, or, or the good things that they bring. They might not match what church might typically be. Well, that's not a church that I want to be a part of. What I want to be a part of is a church that has flavor. That, that wants more from itself than just a social gathering of right-minded people. Yeah. I mean, we're not all in our right minds. <laughs> 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 and the fact that that exists, that we can say and laugh about that and, 
and know that we are so loved by God. This is the greatest present we could ever receive. So, that being said, please consider joining us for the Kenyan Tea on the 24th. Stick around afterwards for what I'm calling the Broadway of Willow Grove <laughs> production that uh, Kim Ruby is you know, designing backstage. I think she actually had to get some uh, financial gather uh, people to sponsor all the, how are you gonna pay for all this talent? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Kim doesn't approach anything like this lightly, I assume. I'm learning this about her as we go on. Uh, but I'm very excited to see how many people are going to be involved. And this is not a one person show, this is a, a family event. And that's what I'm really excited about for Christmas Eve. So if it's not your tradition to go uh, to church on Christmas Eve, what I can say is that uh, you're not gonna get me speaking uh, for hours on end on a Christmas Eve service. So it'll be, it'll be something that you can jump into, engage with, and, and hopefully sing along to. So thanks, Kim, for you and your team for everything you guys are doing for this. It's gonna be great. We do have discourse groups, again, for those that are new, which are times for us immediately following the service. We go downstairs for about 25 minutes to 30 minutes, and we basically just keep dialoguing about what just happened. And we find often that church kind of goes in one ear sometimes and out the other without any engagement with the content. And that's the purpose of discourse groups, that we would go down there and we would wrestle with something that was being said or something that you didn't quite understand and you want to talk it through further. And then we take time to commit one another to prayer and you know help everybody move forward in this life together. I agree with Carl 120% that if you can be open enough and, and not distracted enough to have the prayers and, and, and the requests come through your mind and the Spirit of God will bring those things in while you're driving, while you're reading, while you're getting up and sleeping and in the morning real quick, the first thing you think of, pray. And, and a type of prayer that we talked about many, many months ago is this idea of being open, of being being free enough that the Spirit of God can bring people's faces to you or bring a situation to you that you could stop in that moment and offer that back up to God. Be open taking the notes of the, the different prayer requests. We shouldn't list them online just because some of these things are sensitive, right? But you can take your own notes and then be reflecting on that throughout the rest of the week. That's another way that we do co-create peace for one another. And then after there's uh, the second Sunday every month, when we gather for food. <laughs> so if you want, uh, it's today's Italian, I believe, right? Italian food. Uh, stick around after the discourse groups. That's always open for everyone. You're welcome to stay. And it's a great way to meet people and to get to know the people that you would be serving and ministering with. Um, so you're invited to do that. So Carl wants to know, what does co-creating peace mean? <laughs> Which I think is great. I want to know. Um, I want to see how can I be part of the Lord's peace-making ministry in this world. Peace is a word that is thrown around and sometimes we're told to just give it a chance. Sometimes we're told that when you're a politician, you throw a peace sign up and it means everything's going to be okay. Don't worry, we're bringing the boys home or whatever the case may be. Peace is, is kind of used as a, uh, I think, an ill-fated weapon. And I want to explore just briefly how we can co-create peace and how we, in and of ourselves, cannot make peace, ever. Just like the agape style of love, we cannot harness the agape love of God without Him. We cannot make peace. At the end of last week, we left off with Joseph agreeing to stay with Mary in this journey of the Christ's coming. And with so much unknown and with so much unpredictable in their life, they gave the name Jesus to the baby that was to be born. After Jesus was born, Matthew 2, beginning in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. The beautiful thing about the Matthew 2 version of the Advent, this part of the Advent story, is Matthew is kind of creating characters. I don't know about you, but if you get into a Netflix series or a movie or a show, that's just these TV shows over time. 
the characters that you're drawn into keep you coming back more and more to watch the rest of the show. They watch the next episode, and the characters develop. Some shows actually pride themselves on great characterization. Right? Think about any TV show that you become addicted to. It's probably because the characters were so strong and you got engaged in their lives. That's good storytelling. That's what Matthew's doing here. He's creating some players in the story of Jesus' birth. The first one that he introduces is Herod. Now, he doesn't talk much about it here. He just mentions that this is during the time of King Herod's reign. During the time that this awful individual was in charge of the country. King Herod, we'll find much later, devises some pretty significant schemes to try to rid the earth of Jesus Christ. But the idea and the notion that he would kill all children two years and younger in where he is at pales in comparison to the fact that he, even as he was growing up in his, in his not his ministry, in his office, <laughs> killed his own wife. Children. Nothing stood in the way of Herod to get what he wanted. And all of these things, though, were overlooked by the community because he was building very nice buildings. He was growing uh, a city on a hill. It's amazing how we will overlook certain things. We will overlook certain morals and ethical inadequacies of people if they're producing the long play. <laughs> I'm listening to a, a podcast right now, mostly because I was heavily involved with many people that were in the podcast, which is the, the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. Uh, if you want a podcast to listen to, it is a very good one. But interesting to note in that space is this church that grew from five people to 15, 25,000 people in Seattle, and then in like four months' time was completely annihilated. All became apparent. That at the top level of leadership, certain misgivings were overlooked mm. on purpose. Because the end goal seemed there. A larger church, churches being planted every day, more and more people going baptized. But at the top level, there were misgivings that people said, I can deal with someone that's going to be that way if I get this as the end result. So there's no difference in that story, what happened with that church, as what's going on right now in Jerusalem with Herod. And his ability to, to have these moral deficiencies all over the place, but yet no worries. Because wow, look at that building he built. It's the pride of the world. So he killed his own wife. Doesn't matter. So he's going to eventually try to eradicate Jesus by killing other children. Doesn't matter. So we have the, what I would call, the antagonist. In this story. King Herod. He's the one that wants to kill the protagonist. Jesus Christ. But we have some other players. We have these magi. The, the, the magi that came. The three that came because they followed a star. The magi, by the way, if you saw them in real life, you would wonder why they're the ones that are actually looking for Jesus. They weren't overly religious people. They were dreamers. They were creatives. They were looking at the stars for answers. Probably the reason why they saw the star. <laughs> Many of us don't look to stars for answers. We don't ascribe, I would think, to astrology or looking to see if Libras and Leos and Virgos do different things because of the stars and how they align. But these guys were. They were a unconventional bunch to receive the pronouncement and the direction towards the savior of the world. In a manger. Maybe because they were more willing, maybe because they were open and they were accessible and then they were not close minded and they did not think that a star could not possibly point to where a location of a person is. Instead, they followed it. One of the things that I always think about when I come to the Magi is where's my openness to creativity? How do I allow other voices to speak into me? That might point me to Jesus. I look at the Kenyan tea. I look at the opportunity to hear how things are done halfway around the world now in Willow Grove as a way to show me where Jesus is. The church doesn't play well with dreamers and creatives sometimes because those are the people that touch the edges of our understanding 
They play in the margins. They don't get in line. I'm so thankful that the Magi didn't get in line. I'm so thankful that they were willing to come and to seek and to ask. If we continue reading, they said, where is this king? Now, verse 3, King Herod heard that he was, when King Herod heard about this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. Interesting to me because King Herod's upset and look who else is upset, all of Jerusalem. Why? Because they have to join into his frustration. He is the one that is whipping them up into a frenzy. If he's mad about this king coming on the scene, other than him, he's going to make sure everybody else is upset about this. Because if he's going to be able to, I mean, how did he, hold, how did he pull the plan off of killing all these children? If it wasn't for everybody else on his side. He's devious, but he's also creating a message, a brand, a story. So that when he pronounces what he's going to do, everybody gets along with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. So we have Herod. We have the Magi. And now we're going to get some other folks. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go to him and worship. This is the verse that Carl brought up. King Herod probably thought this was like fishing in a barrel. I got three guys who are dreamers, stargazers, no real desire to, you know, have a function in this world. Probably look at them as like kind of almost lunatics. But for some reason, these lunatics knew the exact location of the coming king. So after he got over the anger that he didn't know that information, right? And then I guess the stars could be seen, but he wasn't looking. He was too busy looking elsewhere. So he tried to bring the Magi in on his team. To try to get them in this frenzied space. But they knew, he knew to be wise enough to kind of demonstrate that the reason he wanted to meet Jesus so badly was so that he could worship him. These crazy weirdo magi saw right through that. Interestingly enough, though, it doesn't record that they said no or yes, that they just sat there and they said they met with him. And once Herod made the request, they left. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for the child. They had been making a careful search. No one had to tell them to be more careful than they already had been. But it is interesting. Make a careful search for the child. When I read that, what happened to me was, how carefully am I searching for this child? I can come here to church on Sunday and I can search for Jesus. Particularly challenging or difficult times in my life, I will carefully search for Jesus. But like the Magi, we are called to consistently be looking for him. <clears throat> and not stopping, and not finding any pleasure in anything else until he is found. They were men on a mission. Not to be deterred. Not to pause this journey. But to find Jesus. It inspires me to live a life that does the same thing. To be in a space where my only search, my only function... Is to find Jesus. Now, I don't have the luxury of a star, a place to walk to, but I have him everywhere in my life. How do I carefully search for Jesus at my job? How do I carefully search for Jesus in my relationships with my neighbors, or the relationships in my own family, or, or the relationships that I don't yet have? How do I search carefully for Jesus in my downtime? How do I search carefully for Jesus when... No one's around watching what I'm doing. I can do whatever I want. Might I be like the Magi and carefully search for him? And then as soon as you find him, I need you to send me a report. Oh, because 
I want to worship him. You can almost see it being played out, right? Like as he's sitting there trying to be pious when he's never been pious. Trying to be a worshiper when he's never been a worshiper. The Magi don't even assume it's something that he wants to do. Skipping a couple of verses. On coming to the house, the Magi saw the child with his mother, Mary. And they bowed down and they worshiped him. To me, the coolest part about this is the journey is fulfilled in worship. You ever make a gift for somebody or, 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 or find the perfect gift, right? Around this time of year, that happens. And you get very, very, very excited to give the gift. We have this joke in our house. We talk about it a lot about giving gifts. And it's uh, always the redirection of time. Don't give gifts that you want the other person to have. <laughs> give the gift that they want. That will actually make everything go a lot better, right? Like I'm so, I mean, I have a, a, a Pyrex glass dish uh, first year of married present that I have never lived down, ever. I was so excited to give my wife these, this set of glass Pyrex dishes, which we still have, by the way. It was a very good purchase. And she opened it up, she looked at me, and she said, you gave me dishes for Christmas. <laughs> I would have loved that gift. I thought it was an amazing gift. I couldn't wait for her to open it. And to my surprise, she didn't want that for Christmas. Any other day of the year, any other, the 364 days of the year, I give her that. She absolutely loves it. But on Christmas, no. <laughs> but we've all had that gift, whether you've made one for somebody or you found the perfect thing, you know they're going to love it, and you're just so excited for them to open it. <laughs> right? Even that, the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh and what it represents for the future of this baby's life pales in comparison to the opportunity to worship him. It's almost like the gifts at this point were ancillary. The entire journey and all the, the frustration and the, and the distraction of getting there finds its fulfillment in worship. And again, looking inwardly, is my fulfillment in Christ worshiping him? Or is it speaking for him, working for him, trying to do things for him? Or is it fulfilled in worship? Is Christmas this year a representation of a worship session? <laughs> or is it something else? I know it's tough with kids because they're so much wrapped up into the Christmas season. It's hard enough to try to get one of our boys to read the Christmas passage on Christmas morning because everybody's all feeling about everything else. But what if we, like the Magi, found our fulfillment in worship this Christmas season? What would it look like for our families to worship Christmas morning? Then they opened their treasures. See, the worship came first. Then they opened their treasures, and they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then, to wrap it up, the best verse. It's almost like a, a, a sentence that is like downplayed, right? Like, because we just got to get on because the very next passage talks about King Herod's plan and this devastating thing he did to the people in his community by killing all these two years and younger children, boys. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the Magi. Remember, Herod had told them, by the way, what I need you to do is just come back and give a report and tell me where he's at so I can go worship him. Now, by all accounts, they should have listened to the king. They should have returned. Whether they said it or not, or whether they agreed in their hearts that they wouldn't, they should. It would be the peaceful thing to do, to respond back to the king, to the request that came. And maybe they were actually intending on doing it, much like maybe Joseph was intending on divorcing Mary. And so the Spirit of God had to intervene and remind them in a dream, don't go back to Herod. And then they didn't. I have to think that if the Spirit of God had to like, wait, pause time, stop time, let me come in here and say what I need you to remember, that they had thought about doing otherwise. Which is great because what they were going to do was going to be a peaceful act because they were requested of something by someone of high power. 
someone that maybe they even feared. I can imagine they even had conversation like, what King Herod wants, King Herod gets. We've seen it happen. And we know the destruction of those who don't do what he wants in this life. So for them to not go back, it's not a good life move for them. Who knows how many shoulders they had to look over to see if King Herod's folks were following them after they found out that they didn't do what the king had requested. So we oftentimes look at this and say, oh, it's a good thing they didn't because then obviously King Herod would have known where Jesus was and, and later on they end up taking Jesus over to Egypt to try to get away from all the stuff that's going on. But in the moment, the Magi, the delicate balance of their lives, they agree to do the right thing, the spiritual thing, the thing that God asked for. Now, co-creating peace. Why is, what is co-creating peace? And why can't we make peace in and of ourselves? I'm a positive person. I always try to look towards the, the goodness in everyone, in everything. My mom, if you know her, is very similar. There's times in life, though, where you realize that you think that you're making peace, but all you're doing is keeping it. See, Jesus says in Matthew 5, during the Beatitudes, to those that were listening to him, a litany of things that, of people that are blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the humble. He says, blessed are the peacemakers. He does not say, blessed are the peacekeepers. Anybody can keep peace. Right? You just make sure that this person doesn't get mad at that person and everything kind of stays in this vanilla space where everybody's okay, right? And, and then, we, then we don't know what to do in Christianity when like a year like last year happens or two years ago happens when we have riots everywhere and the church seems to be split down the middle as to which side of the world they're on, right? And that, that upsets the Christian peacekeeping world. And I realized something about myself during a particularly low time in my life. And I'm really great at keeping peace. I'm really bad at making it. See, to create peace in and of itself kind of goes against who we are as humans. It's not, we don't wake up wanting to make peace. Because with that comes discomfort. With that comes, I mean, Jesus made peace to the world. He died. His peacemaking life <laughs> hung him on a cross. The Magi created peace by not going back to King Herod and probably spent the rest of their life running away from him. We don't make those decisions in life because they're hard. When I think of peace, when I think of the prayer request for Upper Mormon School District, or any school districts, which the school districts right now are definitely in a really weird spot, School board meetings are insane. Kids may or may not be taken care of at different schools. I don't know all the schools out there. And I know that there are tons of teachers and, and faculty that are trying their hardest to do what they can. And others maybe not so much. But it sounds to me like they're just trying to keep the peace. And not make it. Sometimes when there's making peace involved, there's confrontation, there's decisions that need to be made. There are hard answers to hard questions that need to be addressed. Is there someone in your life that you need to stop keeping the peace with and go make it? I don't know. For me, for a long time there was. For a long time, my people very close to me I just wanted them to smile and be happy. I wanted them to have a good life. So I overlooked things that I probably shouldn't have. And I just kept the peace. It's only when I went to make peace that things ever changed. In me, in them. This year, like the Magi, we might be called to make peace. But just know that if we are, you don't go alone. You become the very pure person of Christ in you that goes with you. You are co-creating peace when you go to do that. Young lady, I don't know who you are. But maybe you need to make peace with your mom. And I don't know anything about that story. But I can tell you that for a long time with me and my family, 
I was keeping peace. And nothing was changing. What does it look like for you to make peace? What does it look like for any of us to make peace? It means probably bucking conventional wisdom out there that would tell you to do it this way. It means, well, this is how it's always been done, so I'm just going to kind of get in line and not create a stir. Sometimes you have to create a stir. Making peace is activation. It's not being docile and quiet and sitting back in the corner and hoping that everything out here is going to fix itself so that I can be happy and engage it again. No, sometimes we as believers are called to go in and make it happen. You might not have thought that when Jesus overturned the temples, the, 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 the tables in the temples because of the, what, what had happened to the, the Lord's place was peaceful, but he was making it. He was making peace. You and I can see spaces in this world and in this life where we don't like it and we know it's wrong. Do we just keep peace in those spaces and just kind of like go by and go around it? Or do we jump right in and make peace? Someone's going to have to make peace for the Upper Mormon School District. Maybe it's you, Diane. Maybe. Someone's going to have to make peace. If you're having trouble in your family, if there is like this tension this year coming into the Christmas season, don't just keep the peace and make sure nobody's screaming and arguing. You ask God to go with you to make peace in those spaces. Which might be accompanied by confession and a request for forgiveness. And an agreement to, to, to discern differently that person's life in relationship to yours. Ask Christ to go with you and make peace. Sometimes making peace will hurt. See, it's not peacefulness what we're looking for. That's like a serenity. It's a, a calming thing. That's a, I want to go on vacation. What I'm talking about, what the Magi did, and what I think God is calling us to do in our lives is to co-create peace with Him. To be loud about making peace. And there's ways that we can be quiet and do it as well. I'm not saying that it's all active. I'm not saying that it's all we got to have a rally for everything we want to make peace for. But I do think that we far too often sit on keeping it. Again, not overly Merry Christmas. But just as important during this Advent season. If we want to prepare like they were preparing, like Mary and Joseph, like the Magi, like everyone was preparing for Jesus' arrival on Christmas. Not then, it wasn't called that, but now we do. If we want to prepare for that, making peace is a huge, huge part of the preparation. Just like if you were inviting people over to your house and you were going to have a big shindig and you didn't bother to clean the bathrooms. <laughs> huge no-no. Probably the first place you should start cleaning, right? But if you're going to have people in your house. It's very similar to say I'm going to prepare for the Christ coming. But I'm not going to make peace with people that I need to make peace with. You haven't cleaned your bathrooms. They're dirty. People are coming over. And they're going to need to use them. Don't just keep peace this season. Make it. I'm asking God for myself, what are areas in my life that he needs me to make peace with? Again, whether that's with a person or a conversation with my own sons about the lifestyle that they're living or the things that are surrounding them or all these different things, the spaces that I have opportunity to bring a peacemaking part of my life into. I want to. And my prayer for you all in this Advent season is that you will make peace. Make peace here, out there, in your family, in your home, to the world at large. Because I can guarantee you that the world only hopes that you'll keep it. <laughs> they don't want you to make it. They don't want you to make it. Let's pray. 
Lord, blessed are the peacemakers, you tell us. Therefore, we endeavor to be peacemakers. But we can't do it alone, and we don't always know exactly how to do it. And it is a challenging thing, and so we're not going to walk into it lightly, God, but we're going to require the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, much like the Magi, to give us dreams, to give us understanding that go beyond our own, to point us in directions that we might not be seeing, to help us to understand perspectives that are so unfamiliar to us. Lord, the Magi, they they made peace. They co-created peace. And because of that, Jesus' life was spared. But in the same breath, so many were destroyed. Show us how to take this very unfamiliar approach to life. And even in this Christmas season, may we be prepared to make peace. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Next week we will wrap up with joy, getting us into the Christmas season. Maybe not quite so heavy. (laughs) Thank you everybody for coming. If you're here for the first time, again, I welcome you to stick around for discourse groups. And there's a lunch afterwards. We'd love to have you. See you next week.